If you're anything like the vast majority of 2000s kids across the globe, then you grew up watching Teen Titans. E -E -E -N -D -I -D -N and no, I'm not talking about Teen Titans Go. That's for the younger generations. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll cover that one later. Right now, I'm talking about the OG Teen Titans. Originally released on Cartoon Network in 2003, and beloved by all during our toddler years. For context, the Teen Titan TV series is heavily influenced by the original DC comics that go by the same name. The show takes place in Jump City, which appears to be a large metro complex similar to New York City. A group of unlikely heroes decide to team up after certain circumstances that we'll get to later, in order to create a task force to defend Jump City. Now let's get to the main crew. For starters, we have Robin, the self-proclaimed leader of the group, and some may say the most handsome member of the team. I mean, come on, you cannot tell me that when he turned into Nightwing that he wasn't the most attractive character in existence at this time in animation history. <sighs> what a unit. Uh, okay, enough simping. Anyhow, Robin is, you guessed it, the same Robin from the Batman series. He was professionally trained in ass-kicking by Batman himself and served as a sidekick for many years. Next, we have Raven, a human-demon hybrid child. You really can't get more badass than her. Her father is Trigon, a super-powerful evil demon who's obsessed with having Raven follow in his footsteps into the darkness. Raven luckily was raised good-natured and fled the parallel dimension Azerath whenever she sensed her father's presence growing stronger. Raven has multiple paranormal abilities and is shown to be introverted, assertive, and empathetic, yet scared of getting close to others in fear that she may turn out evil. Almost parallel to Raven is Starfire, or Star for short, a bubbly, extremely emotional, and extroverted alien girl from the planet Tamaran. Starfire comes from a race of aliens that use their emotions in order to fight, which is seemingly why she is quite sensitive and vulnerable to mental breakdowns. She met the Titans during her flea, which we'll get into soon. Oh, and she may have a thing for Robin, or vice versa. Who's to say? Keep watching and find out. Next is Cyborg, or Cy for short, who's a normal human boy but has several different cybernetic parts due to a near-fatal childhood injury. Sai was a student athlete and popular, but was shunned by his family and friends after his cybernetic parts were implemented. Last, but certainly not least, is Beast Boy, a fan favorite and the comedic relief of the group. Beast Boy was a regular boy and grew up traveling to different continent jungles with his parents as a child. His parents were geneticists and particularly interested in a rare green monkey. Unfortunately for Beast Boy, he was accidentally bitten by one and contracted a dangerous disease. In order to save their child's life, his parents vaccinated him, which in turn created his shape-shifting abilities, along with his skin turning green and his teeth getting sharper, seemingly from the monkey bite. Some other characters that we'll run into are Slade, who is Robin's arch nemesis and the main antagonist throughout the show. He's hell-bent on destroying everything in his path while simultaneously gaining as much power as possible. Trigon, who is Raven's aforementioned evil demonic father and arch nemesis, and the villains from Hive, a separate company that is primarily involved in evil affairs. I'm going to be starting with one of the last episodes so that we get some insight on the origin story of the Teen Titans before we begin. This episode acts as a flashback into how it all began. The episode, simply titled Go, begins with Starfire struggling against her captors on an alien ship. She manages to escape after freeing herself from her cell and beating up the guards, crash landing on Earth. Meanwhile, Robin went out on the town for the first time without Batman. He is capturing a burglar when all of a sudden, he sees a large green light slam into the ground a decent ways away. After tying up said burglar, he rushes to the scene. Starfire, who is confused and scared on an alien planet, frantically attempts to get her handcuffs off. Unfortunately, it just looks like she's trying to wreak havoc upon the city as she continuously slams her arms on nearby objects. Robin attempts to stop her, but it quickly turns into a battle between the two as Starfire doesn't understand the damage she is causing. All of a sudden, Beast Boy shows up, slamming Starfire in the side while morphed into a mountain goat. Grand entrance for a grand boy, might I add. He introduces himself to Robin, but before awaiting a response, he instantly recognizes him as Robin, Batman's sidekick. Before getting too annoyed with Beast Boy's admiration, the two watch as Starfire throws an entire bus straight into a civilian. 
Just kidding. Cyborg caught the bus with his superhuman strength since he's built like a machine. Literally. Suddenly, Raven appears from the shadows, blocking the boys from continuing on with their fight. She points out that while Starfire may seem dangerous, it appears that she is handcuffed and distressed. Stand down. What, do you think you the boss or something? Just give me a chance. After calming down, Robin agrees to try and approach Starfire in a calm manner rather than with brute force. Robin offers his aid to a scared Starfire, and she decides to trust him enough to get close in order to remove her cuffs. She then kisses him in order to learn the English language. I know, I know, don't worry people. We will have continuous Starfire Robin updates throughout this video, but this kiss really didn't mean anything. Apparently people from Starfire's planet have the ability to learn complete languages just by kissing someone. So, I'm Beast Boy, who are you? The Titans are about to go their separate ways after Starfire flies away until they hear from the aliens that they are looking to capture Star and force her to be their prisoner. Even while not knowing each other, or her very well, the four of them decide to find her first and protect her against the aliens. She's near. I can sense things. The group is able to do just that, and after accepting such kindness from people she's never met before, Starfire asks to stay on Earth with them, thus forming their Teen Titans group. <laughs> you know, you're kind of funny. You think I'm funny? The second episode in the series, Sisters, begins with three large probes being sent throughout the universe. One heads towards Earth and lands in Jump City, where it instantly finds Starfire, who is on a Ferris wheel with Robin while sharing some cotton candy. Told you we'd win you a prize. <laughs> a giant chicken. The probe attacks Starfire, and even with the help of Robin, she barely makes it away. Who's her new best friend? When they make it back to the tower, they notice an unlikely visitor, who looks strikingly like Starfire, if Starfire was emo. Fittingly, we quickly learn that her name is Blackfire, and is Starfire's older sister. Star is incredibly excited to be visited by one of her family members, but her happiness fades when her jealousy hits. And this mask makes you look very mysterious, so... Everyone on the team seems to love everything about Blackfire, while completely ignoring Star. <laughs> Meanwhile, the three probes that didn't find Star fly back to their spaceship, where armed alien men calculate where the missing probe had gone. Since the one sent to Earth didn't come back, they know that that must be where Star is. Back on Earth, Starfire invites everyone to a movie night and hopes to rekindle their friendship. Action! Comedy! Sci-fi! Horror! But this proves futile after Blackfire invites them to a disco dance club instead. Starfire, while at the club, decides to climb up onto the roof because she feels extremely out of place. You digging the scene? I did not know we were supposed to bring shovels. Robin follows her, and she vents to him about how she feels like an outsider. He reassures her that this isn't the case, and that she should be having fun with all of them instead of feeling down about herself. All of a sudden, Blackfire shows up to steal Robin away, wearing Star's clothes and a pink wig. Come on, Titans, it should be painfully obvious at this point that Blackfire is trying to be a slithery snake. The three other probes suddenly show up to capture Star, but Blackfire quickly and efficiently shoots them down. When confronted by Robin about her insane ability to know exactly where to hit the probes, Blackfire claims it was just a lucky guess. Cyborg, much to Starfire's surprise, invites Blackfire onto the team. Me? A Teen Titan? <gasps> Starfire decides to abandon the Titans and Earth, thinking that Blackfire will inevitably replace her and that they don't need her anymore. Robin confronts her, though, and during their talk, the armed alien men who sent the probes show up. My friend stays here. The aliens explain that they are actually intergalactic policemen and that they are looking for a Tamaranian teenage girl. Uh, you can't be the good guys. We're the good guys. Who's a thief and a liar, amongst lots of other things. Starfire and Robin instantly realize that they have been swindled by Blackfire and that she was trying to steal Starfire's place so that the aliens would capture Star instead of her. She is then seen trying to flee Earth, but Starfire, after the most epic sibling battle one might ever witness, easily defeats her and turns her in. 
After all the commotion, Starfire explains to Robin how she really felt about Blackfire being on the team and how she felt as though she would be replaced. Robin emphasizes that nobody would ever be able to replace her. You see, folks, I told you there'd be more Starfire Robin updates. The episode, The Final Exam, begins with Hive Academy, the hierarchy of international vengeance and extermination, showcasing its top graduate students to notorious supervillains for employment. One of these villains is none other than Mr. Slade, the big baddie of the show. The top students consisted of Gizmo, who makes inventions and is an evil genius, Jinx, who can place nasty hexes on people, and Mammoth, who has superhuman strength. And for the right price, this ideal team can be yours. Slade is impressed by the newbies, but tells them that in order for them to actually start working for him, they must defeat the Teen Titans. Speaking of the Titans, they went out to eat at a pizza parlor since all of their food went bad in the tower. A large pizza with pickles, bananas, and mint frosting. Just then, the Hive villains appear and beat the Titans senselessly, resulting in a distraught Raven, Starfire, Beast Boy, and Cyborg. Mammoth's yeah, gonna make you extinct. Concerningly, after the fight, Robin was nowhere to be found. Back at the tower, the Titans wait impatiently for Robin's return, but are greeted by the villains again. <laughs> Losing yet another battle, the Titans are thrown out of their own tower and still have no idea where their leader could possibly be. Back in the tower, the Hive students move into their own rooms and redecorate the entire tower to suit them instead. All their food is way out of date. They even end up turning the giant T into an H somehow. Robin inevitably shows up on the beach with the others, and they quickly devise a plan to get their home back. Cyborg activates one of his cyber arms and instructs it to set off the security system. This isn't over. It's just getting started. Gizmo fearfully attempted to call Slade, which intrigues Robin, and he wants to know more about him. He is unable to get the information out of Gizmo before they are taken to police. Back at the Hive Academy, the headmistress and Slade are watching. The headmistress apologizes that her students failed him, but he reveals that he never actually expected them to be able to defeat the Titans. He just wanted the Titans to get a message. And the message has been received. Who is Slade? The episode ends with the Titans happily watching TV together after their long day. <gasps> Someone has disposed of all our blue furry food! Time for a Raven episode, fittingly titled Nevermore. Edgar Allan Poe fans are popping off right now. It begins with Raven losing her cool during a battle. After all hopes seem lost, Raven is the last one fighting Dr. Light. Too bad the rest of your life is going to be behind bars! <laughs> no, not that Dr. Light. This Dr. Light. You do not want to get up! She doesn't seem to be able to win until he aggravates her to no end. Raven suddenly turns into a dark and shadowy creature, scaring Dr. Light to wit's end, and also her friends in the process. Yeesh. It was no so dark. Make it stop. The Titans get her away from him and ask what's wrong, to which she growls and flashes her glowing red eyes at them. The next morning, things aren't any better. After Beast Boy offers her breakfast, she acts the same as the night before. <laughs> That's not even real milk! Beast Boy doesn't think anything of it, though, since Raven normally acts like that towards him. Although, with some pressure from the other Titans, he approaches her room. After being locked out, Cyborg accidentally knocks it all the way down, and so he and Beast Boy infiltrate her room in a hope to find out more about her. We're in Raven's room. We should not be in Raven's room. Beast Boy finds a strange-looking mirror and is quickly captured by a huge arm emitting from it. And unfortunately for Cyborg, while trying to rescue Beast Boy from the strange arm, he is sucked in as well. The boys find themselves in a strange dark space with glowing red stars all around them. Who booby traps a mirror? Maybe it wasn't a trap. Maybe it's Raven's way home. After wondering for a while, they run into an oddly bubbly, pinker version of Raven. This Raven tells the boys not to enter the doorway, but they do so anyway. only to be transported to a much pinker, dreamier version of the void they were just in. Later on, they wander upon a gray version of her who emits fear. 
Where were you? Shopping for ropes? <laughs> and a military green version who seems quite brave. Hoorah! High fives, come on! Meanwhile, in the real world, Raven was just told that the boys were in her room, and much to her horror, she notices the mirror on the floor. Back in her mind space, all three Ravens appear, and Cyborg realizes that they are different forms of Raven's personality. The real Raven then appears and tells the boys that they must leave her mind immediately, as something bad is on the loose. The mirror you found is for meditation. It's a portal into my mind, not a toy! Beast Boy, who is extremely fed up with Raven being mysterious all the time, demands that she tell them what's been going on with her. All of a sudden, they are confronted with a massive, demon-like version of Raven, who strikingly resembles her father. The three begin a battle, but all are futile. <laughs> Beast Boy and Cyborg tell Raven that the only way for her to defeat her rage is for all of her emotions to fight by her side. Raven, after arguing with the two about how they shouldn't have to bear her burdens with her, calls up her other emotions and easily defeats the rage. Raven then absorbs all of the different core emotions and becomes a more well-rounded individual because of it. The episode ends with Raven actually getting excited about breakfast, which is something that's never happened before. I mean, that's fair. I'm not a morning person myself. Time to look at the episode Masks, which debuts a now TikTok famous character. The later episode begins with Robin being swindled by Slade yet again. By this point, the mysterious assassin has really been getting under Robin's skin in general. What's worse, Robin hasn't been successful in finding out any information on him despite his best efforts, and Slade continuously mocks Robin because of it. Due to all his pent-up frustration, he becomes angsty and brooding, and distances himself from the other Titans. They both sound so good. Yeah, it's really hard to pick. Wanna watch them both? He ignores missions he's supposed to go on and tells them to go deal with the villains themselves while he works on finding more information on Slade. Not only is Robin acting weird, but all of a sudden a new villain appears during this time frame named Red X. It's shown that he is in direct communication with Slade, trying to get Slade to meet up with him. <laughs> After another encounter with this so-called villain, who might I add oddly saved Beast Boy's life and easily defeats the Titans as he knows all of the Titans' weaknesses, the show then cuts to Red X taking off his mask after being welcome to meet Slade, revealing Robin's face underneath. Dude, did you just save me? No! Soon after, Starfire goes into Robin's room to talk to him and finds a holograph of Slade pinning Robin down, revealing his secret to the Titans as well. When meeting Slade, he reveals that he knew Red X was Robin all along, and that not only is Robin a fool for thinking his plan would work out, but he has also betrayed the trust of all his friends. This ends now! <laughs> What's up, baby? Did you miss me? The episode ends with Starfire sadly confirming Slade's words, telling Robin that he doesn't trust anyone. Slade did not trust you, and you did not trust us. Oh, also Slade escapes as per usual. That'll do Robin's mood wonders. The beginning of this two-part episode begins with Robin having a morality crisis. What else is new? In his nightmares, he is taunted by Slade, told that he's just like him, and that he destroys everything that he loves. When Robin is finally able to demask him, he is greeted by his own face staring back at him. A shout out to the Empire Strikes Back cave scene, perhaps? When Robin wakes up, he is distressed, as expected, but of course, his search and obsession does not subside. Slade disrupts the Titans again and threatens them with a detonator of sorts. Upon battle with Slade's minions, Robin goes haywire and starts absolutely demolishing all of the minions, even after they are already dead. Robin then angrily asks a random bystander if they know anything about Slade, but when the man says he doesn't know what Robin is talking about, he proceeds to raise his arm, ready to beat the information out of him. The Titans stop him, however, and Beast Boy claims that Robin is actually starting to act like Slade now. This enrages Robin even more. Is 
Titans and Titans. The Titans briefly split up, leaving Robin to defeat Cinderblock, revealing a locator chip that reveals Slade's location. Where is he? Robin then rushes to the scene to confront Slade once and for all. Once there, he demands Slade to give up the remote to the detonator. But after a brief brawl, Slade reveals that there is no remote because there is no detonator to turn off in the first place. The only reason he led Robin there was to offer, more like, force him to become his apprentice. He explains that while Robin's friends were searching for the detonator, they were shot by probes that injected devices into their bodies that can cause them to die at any time upon Slade's command, and that if Robin refused to become his apprentice and carry out his legacy, then he would kill his friends without a second thought. And Robin, I've chosen you. Congratulations. At the end of the episode, Robin is seen wearing Slade's little outfit as Slade announces his new apprentice. This is getting super comic booky. Part two begins with the Titans searching for Robin, but they are unable to find him anywhere. The show then cuts to Slade forcing Robin to steal. <laughs> Once Robin makes it back to Slade's lair, he confronts him and tells him that he won't be able to control him forever, and that the second his friends aren't in vital danger, he is going to make Slade pay for all that he has put him through. Slade then once again tells Robin that the two of them are similar, and that is exactly how he would think as well if he were in Robin's position. Slade goes on to tell Robin that while monitoring his heart rate during the theft, that his endorphins and adrenaline were high, meaning he might not have hated it as much as he was portraying. Who knows? I might even become like a father to you. Meanwhile, back at the tower, the Titans are confused as to what is happening, but are obligated to fight Robin nonetheless as well. Disgruntled radioactive clone. Ow. He is a villain now, after all. During their fight, Robin is ordered to shoot Starfire with a thermal blaster, but Robin chooses not to do this as he deeply cares about her. Slade then triggers the probes inside the Titan's bodies and they start to wither away. Robin, scared and not knowing how to help them, begs Slade to stop, to which Slade tells Robin that he must fight them with all his firepower or he will kill them. Robin uses the thermal blaster, but not before muttering an I'm sorry back to Star. Perhaps it is Slade who has learned a new trick. Back at the tower, the Titans digest what just happened, and Starfire is convinced that Robin is being controlled by Slade somehow. And you guys thought my zombie idea was crazy. Meanwhile, after the fight with the Titans, Robin is infuriated and decides to brawl with Slade. Slade remarks that Robin has gotten more powerful since their last match ever since he's been training under him. Finally, back at the tower, the Titans realize that they are filled with millions of Slade's probes after hooking up Beast Boy to one of their computers. They head straight to Slade in order to confront him and rescue Robin from this torture. Once there, they begin a battle with Slade, even after knowing about the probes. We are your friends, Robin. We are not leaving without you. Robin, who is told to fight the Titans or they die, chooses instead to inject himself with probes, leaving him to die along with the Titans if Slade doesn't back off. Slade, furious, releases the probes, and the Titans relentlessly beat him up before he is forced to retreat. <laughs> Back at the tower, Robin apologizes to his friends for all that he has done, and he reveals a life lesson that he learned while being Slade's apprentice. While he may be a lot like Slade, he has best friends to help him get through life, while Slade literally has nobody. Shouldn't we celebrate or something? Which, at the end of the day, is probably the reason why he's forcing some kid to be his apprentice. This first episode of season two, How Long Is Forever, begins with a heavy hitter of sorts. Starfire is distraught thinking about her friend splitting up one day, and then coincidentally, while fighting a time-traveling villain, Star gets sucked 20 years into the future. Once there, she finds the Titan's tower run down and on the verge of crumbling. Even worse, upon entering, she finds Cyborg near death hooked up to an old machine. You fell through a wormhole and... Welcome to the future. 
He explains that they had all gone their separate ways after Star's disappearance, and that he can't help her find any of the other Titans since he cannot leave his machine or he will die. However, he does point her in the direction of the others. Star finds Beast Boy first, a fat, bald version of him working for the circus. She then finds Raven, who has actually gone insane after being alone for so long. Without friends, you must have... <gasps> Star heads out to continue to look for Robin, but is confronted with the time-traveling villain from before. She demands him to stop messing with her future, but he explains that he isn't able to mess with the fabric of time, he only travels in it. This upsets Star a lot, but before Warp can defeat Star once and for all, an older, darker version of Robin comes to her rescue. Robin? I haven't used that name in a long time. He introduces himself as Nightwing. Treat me like white Don't get me dirty. Starfire explains how she feels about all the Titans splitting up and how she didn't mean to leave back in regular time. Nightwing calls in the Titans for one last mission to try and fix what has occurred. Starfire and Nightwing confront Warp but come up slightly short. That is, however, until the other Titans pull through and help them out. Starfire gets the time machine back, and once back in her own time, she explains to her friends what happened. The Titans are mocked by the knowledge of them not being friends anymore, but are certain that they will be able to maintain their friendship, especially considering them changing Warp's future. There's no reason they can't change theirs, too. Oh, it's never too late. Happy Blothog! Here's a big one, Terra. This episode begins with the Titans finding a new friend and Beast Boy finding himself a lover. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Bass food. No, Beast Boy. <laughs> Anyways, the Titans find a blonde girl interacting with a giant scorpion, but upon further investigation, they realize that she isn't in any danger after watching her smash the scorpion with a giant boulder. Apparently, this new girl has levitation abilities that allow her to move rocks with her mind. Don't get too attached, my young friend. I saw her first. They decide to approach her and introduce themselves, but she already knew who everyone was given that they are the heroes of the city. They invite her back to the tower, and Beast Boy is head over heels the entire time. <coughs> Meanwhile, Slade is watching them from the shadows and continually mumbles, but I found her first. He is probably butthurt because he was trying to snag another new apprentice since the Robin thing didn't work out. Once there, they offer her a spot on the team, as she is a very powerful individual, and they seem to be getting along with her just fine. <sighs> she agrees, but that night, Beast Boy finds her outside skipping rocks, and she tells him that she plans on leaving the next morning, mostly because she can't actually control her powers. Beast Boy, as you'd expect, begs her not to go, and promises he won't tell the other Titans about her inability to control herself. <sighs> <laughs> because of this, she promises that she'll stay for one more full day. The next day, they get an alarm that Slade has been spotted trying to steal diamonds from a mine. They all rush to the scene and begin a battle against Slade and his minions. In the middle of everything, Terra accidentally crushes Beast Boy with a giant boulder. Unable to help him, she gets scared of rejection from the other Titans and runs away. Slade corners her and offers his help in training her ability. He reminds her of all the destruction she's caused around the world with her landslides and earthquakes that have happened because she's so... In, un in control of her ability? That's a word script writer. Anyway, she becomes distraught by all of his negative words and creates a small hurricane, forcing everyone out of the mines. No one else understands you, Terra. No one else can help you. I'll be waiting. Slade escapes and Beast Boy tries to comfort Terra by reassuring her once more that he wouldn't ever tell the Titans about what happened or that she can't control her abilities. But unfortunately, Robin figured out her secret himself. He offered her a spot regardless, but mentioned that she's going to need to train her ability to keep it more in check. Terra obviously thinks that Beast Boy snitched on her and gets incredibly upset and runs away. I didn't know it was a secret. She didn't even say goodbye. 
The episode ends with Slade watching from his computer and muttering about how she will come crawling back to him no matter what happens. Time for a date with destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the first major Starfire and Robin relationship update episode. Here we see Robin being forced to take someone out for their prom and Starfire gets incredibly jealous over this. Did we have some punch? Obviously hinting at her hidden crush slash love for Robin. Keep your legs off my boy! Yeah, that's all. In Titan Rising, Terra returned shortly after her last showing by manipulating Beast Boy's volleyball. How's it? <laughs> What's up? She claims that she is much more well-versed in her abilities than she was the first time around, but something about her seems off. She profusely asks to be on the Titans team, but they are hesitant due to how badly she blew up last time they suggested her to join them. Suddenly, earthquakes shake the city, and the Titans go to investigate. They invite Terra along, mostly because of her rock-moving abilities, but Raven is incredibly skeptical of her. Everything okay? Can't tell. They shortly realize that it isn't an earthquake, but rather something moving in a straight line underground. It soon reveals itself as a giant mechanical worm. Terra tries to fling a large boulder onto the worm, but Raven resists this plan using her own telekinetic abilities. Eventually, the boulder crumbles and the worm buries itself deep underground. Raven is pissed because of Terra's reckless behavior, and the Titans are upset because they find that the owner of the mechanical worm is none other than Slade himself. They begin their journey down the tunnel where Raven and Terra get into it yet again. The next time I tell you something's too dangerous, take my word for it! With Raven telling Terra that she will never be a Teen Titan if she continues to endanger her friends. Beast Boy tries cheering Terra up by telling her that Raven is always this aggressive, but she usually isn't. The Titans split up since they were bombarded by miniature mechanical worms. Hello? That sentence is so freaking odd. Anywho, Raven, Terra, and Robin end up making it to the main control room while Cyborg, Star, and Beast Boy follow the trail from the worms. They all quickly realize that the worms are heading for the surface and plan on attacking the Titan's tower, wanting to sink it into the sea. However, after a long and hard battle, Terra unleashes her full ability in order to save the tower, and the Titans reward her by offering a spot on the team. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Welcome, new Titan! All is well, but something about her still feels off. Spoiler alert, Terra ends up being a snake after it becomes obvious that she's working with Slade. Or should I say, a mole? Get it? Cause, cause they go underground? Uh, all right, I'll stop. The episode Betrayal begins with a mysterious figure videoing Slade, who has a bright blue eyeball. We are most mirthful to claim you as our friend. Yeah, what they say. Tara is then seen acting super suspicious at the tower. Beast Boy ends up getting the balls to ask her on a date, and at first she rejects him, probably because she feels bad for being a horrible person and friend. She changes her mind, however, and takes him out on a day-long date. While she allows all of Slade's robot minions to infiltrate the tower and battle the other Titans. While on a Ferris wheel and after a day of bonding with Beast Boy romantically, she asks him if she can tell him something bad about her and if he would still be her friend. He replies yes, but right after this, Slade finds them and attacks. Terra, no! Beast Boy and Terra attempt to fend off Slade, but when he announces that Terra is his new apprentice, Beast Boy goes into a frenzy. Furious with Terra, he tells her that she has no friends, even after she breaks down crying and apologizing for all that she has done. I never meant for any of this to happen. Then why did you let it? Because of his words, she decides to leave with Slade, as he is the only person in her life now. 
The next morning, the Titans are all upset with Terra for betraying them, but none are as upset as Beast Boy, who is seen curled up in his bed as a dog wrapped around the heart-shaped box he made her earlier before their date. Immediately following the last episode is a two-parter, Aftershock. Part 1 begins with Terra throwing a boulder at the Titans and battling them ruthlessly. <laughs> The Titans are unable to fight her like how they would fight any other criminal, since they still see her as a friend. Beast Boy begs them to give her another chance, as they all gave Robin another chance after he was being blackmailed by Slade, and the others agree. That is, until Terra shows no mercy and greatly injures all of the Titans. Hope you're not expecting a goodbye kiss. Terra, you can't. By the end of the episode, the Titans are fed up with her and decide to go after her with all they've got. No more mercy. Part 2 time! The Titans ambush Terra, but she is unable to defeat them. You attempted to annihilate us! Did you think we wouldn't take it personally? She calls for Slade's help multiple times, but the most he does is send other bad guys to fight with her. She eventually escapes and makes it back to Slade's lair, only for him to hit her and ruthlessly tell her that she's failed her mission. What a jerk! It's at this moment that Terra realizes that nobody in her life cares about her. She decides to leave Slade's lair, but is rudely told no, when Slade explains that the suit he has given her has fused to her skin, thus letting him control her powers on a whim. Kind of brutal for a kid's cartoon. You promise to fight at my side forever, and that's a promise I intend to make you keep. Beast Boy attempts to find Terra, but when he comes across her, she's a total mess and begs him to kill her. Slade then appears and forces Terra to start finding Beast Boy. He tells her that she's stronger than him, and eventually she's able to fight back. She presumably kills Slade, but in the process, she creates a strong volcano that's about to erupt. Beast Boy begs her to evacuate with them, but she knows she's the only one strong enough to stop the volcano, so she declines. You were the best friend I ever had. The two embrace for the last time. Terra uses up all of her energy to stop the volcano from erupting, turning herself to stone in the process. The next day, the Titans visit her statue and place a plaque honoring her life as a teen Titan. We'll be searching for a way to reverse the effect. We'll bring her back. Season 3 begins with the episode Deception, and has Cyborg going ghost. After noticing an increased number of robberies, the Titans decide to launch an undercover mission. Cyborg created a device that allows him to resemble his past self before he was part robot, and this apparently also makes him sort of hard to recognize. But he can bench press a box. He is then sent to the Hive Academy and hopes to infiltrate their school in order to find out what's causing such a large increase in crime. Once there, Cyborg meets Brother Blood, who ends up being the new villain of the show and the new headmaster at Hive. Fail me again, and I'll have you sent to your doom! Blood is intrigued by Cyborg and ends up exposing that he knew who he was all along. He promises Cyborg that he can make him fully human again if he pledges his allegiance towards him. And Cyborg quickly agrees as he has always wanted to turn back to how he used to be. What is up with people in this show jumping from one side to another? Literally none of them seem to be completely loyal. Cyborg, take it easy. Just kidding! The Titans infiltrate the Academy after losing connection to Cyborg, and just when you think he's going to harm them, he instead turns his focus to Brother Blood, causing enough chaos for all of them to escape. You left the Titans. That means you have to be initiated all over again. Now on to the episode X. Some of these titles are simpler than others. Anywho, back and worse than ever is Red X, the villain persona Robin put on in the past. After realizing that someone has stolen Robin's suit, the Titans go to try and stop him. However, Robin explains that there's a powerful chemical substance that unlocks the full power of the suit, assuming that that is what Red X is looking for. You powered that suit with Xenothium? Are you crazy, man? That stuff is dangerous! After getting a lead on where to find this chemical, Robin and the others head to the scene. Once there, Red X takes out all of the Titans except for Robin, and a battle ensues. <laughs> During battle, Robin learns that this new Red X is basically just an adrenaline junkie and shouldn't be allowed to wear anything like the suit he currently has on. <laughs> 
Red X even threatens Robin with all of their lives if he doesn't let them go, saying he will trigger a massive explosion from the chemicals. After scuffling for quite some time, several people show up in hazmat suits. They reveal that they are henchmen for Professor Chang, another villain who was looking for the hazardous chemical, except he just wants to use it to blow up Jump City, which in a way is somehow even less noble than trying to power your supervillain suit. I didn't just steal the ore. I stole your friends. Robin attempts to convince Red X to help him, but he isn't having any of it. That is, until Robin begins falling to his death. <laughs> Red X comes to the rescue and successfully helps them in defeating Shang. Afterwards, though, he still attempts to steal the chemical. This is when Robin reveals that he actually stole the part of the suit that holds the chemical that powers everything, leaving him in just a regular old suit. Red X then throws some of the chemical at their feet, causing enough of a distraction to escape. The episode then ends with Robin pondering over the line of good and evil, and how easy it is to cross it. Does one good deed make him a hero? Am I to blame for all of it because of a single mistake? Next up is the episode Spellbound. Raven, as per usual, feels misunderstood. As the most angsty character in the series, she tends to keep it to herself, but this isn't always due to her anti-socialness. Wanna be referee? Go away. While caught up in a book, Raven wishes that somebody would finally understand her, and to her shock, the wizard from her book responds. She feels touched as he genuinely seems to like the real her, and she even learns different spells from him. Raven, I've been waiting for you. Raven gets so attached to the guy that she eventually wants him out of the book in order for them to be even closer. He eventually tells her how, but once out, he begins acting strange. Almost got it. Raven soon finds that she has been betrayed and that he is actually the villain from her book, not the hero. She banishes him back to the book and feels defeated and lonely once more. Beast Boy corrects her, however, and Raven seems to be looking at him perhaps for the first time. She hugs him and thanks him for being such a good friend. In the first part of the two-part season finale, Titans East, Cyborg is sent over to Titans East to help them complete their tower. It's like 80 below, the hail's messing up my paint job, and why did I volunteer for this? Unfortunately, Steamroller, a giant villain who steamrolls, very creative, shows up and puts a setback in their plan. You're the first lowlife to get busted by the Titans. <laughs> They eventually defeat him, but during the battle, Brother Blood steals their keys in order to infiltrate their tower. Come along, boys. We've got students to recruit. Meanwhile, Cyborg is having a good time with the Titans of Titan East, and they admire him so much that they even ask him to become their new leader, as they are a new branch in general. All of a sudden, Brother Blood's minions show up all throughout the tower, resembling clones of Cyborg. Titans move! After a battle ensues, the East team ends up winning. Or at least, they think so. Cyborg accepts the new Titan's request to be their leader, but later that night, it's revealed that all of Titan East has been brainwashed by Brother Blood, and getting Cyborg to stay there was part of the plan all along. In part two, Robin is notably upset with Cyborg for quitting on him after a heated phone call. But if you can turn your back on us after everything we've been through, you're nothing but a spoiled child! Meanwhile, Titans East report to Brother Blood about Cyborg's loss of connection with the original Teen Titans. One of the members shoots Cyborg, revealing their true motives and the fact that they are under mind control. Before Brother Blood can do any real harm to Cyborg, however, the original Titans show up to the rescue. Go easy on them. They're still my friend. Cyborg eventually defeats Brother Blood, who is promptly sent to jail. And to cap it all off, Cyborg then decides to stay with the OG Titans instead, promoting Bumblebee as East's new leader. This Brother Blood arc is actually really fun. Give it a full on watch if you ever want some cool action scenes and an interesting character study on Cyborg. You won't be disappointed. I believe it was Socrates who said, if you can't beat him, Join them. Okay, season four. We're looking at the episode Birthmark. I've never seen anyone less excited for their birthday. This episode begins with Raven being more broody than normal. Remember me? 
I'd like to go to jail now, please. She mentions that she needs to stay at the tower until midnight, but once she begins hibernating in her room, the Titans throw her a surprise party. Surprise! Ah! Uh, Raven? She angrily destroys all of the decorations and tells them that there isn't anything to be celebrating. If anything, it's a major negative. They don't understand. Until Slade appears? I was beginning to think I'd never see your smiling faces again. They're confused as to how he is in front of them since Terra defeated him in battle, but once he approaches, it becomes obvious that he's only there for Raven. He also has newfound firepower abilities. He burns an emblem into Raven's arm as she becomes increasingly more freaked out. She even stops time in hopes to avoid him, but her powers don't seem to be having an effect on Slade, which is really weird. Also, wait, didn't this dude die? Deadpool? Deadpool? What? I I'm not Deadpool. I thought Deadpool was a good guy. After scuffling with him for a while, he finally gets his message across. He shows her a scene resembling hell all around her, claiming that this is the future she's destined to cause. It began the day you were born, and nothing can stop it. The episode then ends with Slade speaking to a faceless figure, saying that the first part of the plan is complete, and that she surely will complete her task assigned to her from birth. Following the birthmark, we have the episode The Prophecy. The Titans have been searching for answers regarding Raven's symbol on her head. Cryptic threats, targeting Raven, Slade's playing a whole new game now. After Slade appears again, he explains to the Titans that she is the daughter of Trigon the Terrible, and she is the gem that will summon him to Earth and end the mortal world as they know it. Raven is worried that her friends will shun her, but this is not the case. The Titans, being good friends and such, all vow to try to help save the world, and her in the process. The episode ends with Trigon telling Slade that if he continues to be his little messenger, then he might be able to come back to life for real. So, wait, what exactly is he now? My life for Nazul. Time for a big season four finale, the end. Raven wakes up with marks on her hands and realizes in shock that she is about to be the cause of the end of the world. She tries to make the most of her last day, making pancakes for her friends, protecting them in battle, and even giving them pizza afterwards. Even though the girl has no clue how to cook. They only realize that today is the day when Slade appears. They take Raven to the fortress they created just in case this day ever actually arrived, but she's forced to leave, and Slade threatens the life of her friends. Goodbye. Be safe. She then tells Slade that he will soon be just as insignificant as her in her father's eyes, but he doesn't believe her. She traps her friends in order to spare them as she sacrifices her body in order for her father to use it as a portal. You're willing to give up on everything, all because of some prophecy you heard as a child? The episode ends with Trigon banishing Slade after telling him that he wasn't actually successful in any part of the plan, revealing that Raven was correct about how her father really operates. Starting off right where the last episode left off, the world has turned to hell and only the Titans have survived. They find that Raven left them with some form of her own power after they hold hands and feel a burst of energy. They attempt to fight Trigon with this newfound power, but unsurprisingly, it does nothing to him. They then run to Slade, who promises he knows how to get Raven back. And while at first the team is skeptical of him, they realize that they literally have no other choice. with your trickery. Robin and Slade head to some secret place Slade knows of, while the other Titans battle against Trigon in order to distract him. On the way, Slade reveals to Robin that when Terra exploded him, Trigon saved his life and promised that if he was able to retrieve Raven, then he would gain his humanity back. After a seemingly long journey, Slade leaves Robin to go off on his own. Robin then finds a small girl, and after lifting her cloak, he realizes that it's a younger version of Raven. The episode ends with her looking up at him with fear in her eyes and asks, 
Who are you? Part 3 begins with Trigon revealing to one of his henchmen that he already knew of the Titan's plan to try and find Raven. He explains that while some form of her still exists, she is nothing like the person she was, and they will never get their friend fully back like how they intend. With you gone, Robin will be all mine. He will not. Meanwhile, Robin tries his best to make Little Raven feel comfortable and eventually wins over her trust, although she was quite skeptical of him. What you seek cannot be reclaimed. But it's not like I have anything left to lose. Robin tells her stories of her real self as he begins to take her back to his friends who are still fighting Trigon. Um, he's coming over here. I really don't like that he's coming over here. He realizes that she does remember at least a little bit as she calls him by name. She is still terrified of her father though, and doesn't think anything can be done to stop him. Robin assures her that while the world may be ending, all of her friends are still together fighting. Once reunited, Trigon taunts Raven, saying that she'll never be able to defeat him and that she was created only to serve him. Raven opens her eyes, and a glowing white light emits from them. She gains her age back and revokes ever being related to Trigon. Wretched, insignificant. She then hits them with more power than anyone ever thought she had inside of her, and he is finally defeated. The world goes back to normal, and their long nightmare finally ends. After the shock of the victory, Robin congratulates Raven for being the most hopeful person he knows. She hugs Robin tightly and thanks him for never giving up on her, even with extreme odds against her. I am a Rorfian Zopgar. <laughs> Raven is now free to live her life without horrible dread of the future and can truly embrace herself as she is finally her own person and not a vicious shadow of her father. Skipping ahead a bit through Season 5, we have the episode Lightspeed. Jinx, the leader of Hive, gets herself a man. The episode begins with Hive robbing, as per usual. I believe these should be the property of Bill and Numerous. Start grabbing! Except that their plans are foiled by an incredibly fast boy named Kid Flash. He leaves Jinx a rose, which leaves her confused, but also intrigued. I paid for that! Throughout the episode, they attempt to capture him, and whenever Jinx and him are alone, he persuades her to leave the villain lifestyle as he can tell she isn't happy with herself. If you're called the Hive Five, how come there are six of you? It isn't until the very end of the episode that she seems to agree. She releases Kid Flash after capturing him for the last time, and follows him into the night after accepting another rose. Kinda an odd couple, but you know, I've seen weirder. The episode Calling All Titans begins with Robin making a plan to give each individual hero their own communicator device in order to communicate with each other more efficiently. Unfortunately for him, the Brain, a big bad villain despite the ironically dumb name, stole one of the communicators in order to spy on the Titans and their allies. That's Project Brian, dude. No, Brain. B R I. The Titans spread out around the world in order to give out their new devices, but after their task is complete, the Brain alerts the Brotherhood of Evil, and a full-fledged coordinated attack commences. Wait a minute, that's not my heart. Some of the Titans are successful in their battles, but Robin is not one of them, as he has been captured by Madame Rogue and tied up with some of their other allies. Next episode, with Robin and multiple other heroes captured across the world, it seems as though the Brotherhood of Evil reigns victorious. You will fall one by one. Little to their knowledge, Beast Boy creates his own ragtag team of weaker heroes and hopes to rebel against the villains in his own way. During their battle, all odds seem to be against them. And they're about to lose when all of a sudden, several groups of heroes arrive in rescue, including Starfire and Cyborg. During their fight, some of the other Titans go off to release literally all of the other ones, causing the battle to tilt extremely in their favor. The heroes easily beat the villains, and all is well once again. Brain freeze. <laughs> also, side note, Jinx and Kid Flash were seen helping the heroes as well. Sorry I'm late. I had to pick up a friend. 
You were with him? Traitor! The last episode of Teen Titans, Things Change is all about the chase. It starts after Beast Boy happens to see Terra during a fight with a large monster. After the battle, Beast Boy goes on his own solo journey to try and find her again. And while he eventually succeeds, she has no memory of him or anything about the Titans. This greatly upsets Beast Boy for obvious reasons. He tries to jog her memory, but nothing works. He gets so frustrated by this that he ends up throwing mud at her to try and force her to use her powers, but it just slaps her in the face. I made that for you. Remember, Terra? It's cute. Listen, I've really gotta go. Beast Boy even asks Slade what's wrong with her, to which he responds that she must not have wanted to remember him or her powers. This even further upsets Beast Boy, again for obvious reasons. You can't keep following me. Why not? It's the girls' locker room. The episode ends with Beast Boy coming to terms with the fact that Terra wanted to live out her normal girl life, even if that means not knowing him. The series concludes with Beast Boy looking towards the future with his friends in mind. And, uh, <laughs> hopefully Raven. Yo, girl! Oh boy, movie time! We're looking at the first Teen Titans movie, Trouble in Tokyo. The movie begins with the Titans fighting a neon blue and pink colored ninja type villain. They eventually capture him, but are unable to interrogate or communicate with him in general as he only speaks Japanese. Robin ends up using a translation device, and they find that the Cotton Candy Ninja was actually sent by a higher-up Japanese villain named Brashogun. As soon as they find out about Brashogun, the Cotton Candy villain escapes, and in order to track him down, they decide to head to Tokyo, which is where Brashogun is located. Once there, it is shown that there is a mysterious figure spying on them from their computer. It's presumed that this is Brashogun, as he claims that his cover might have been shown. Shortly after this, the Titans end up fighting a strange green monster, and during the battle, the Tokyo Troopers show up to help them. Their leader, Daizo, explains to them that they are the heroes of their own city. They even have a headquarters that is similar to the Titan's Tower. Robin explains to Daizo that they have been searching for Brashogun. Daizo basically laughs in Robin's face and claims that Brashogun is no more than an urban legend. This greatly upsets Robin and the other Titans as they traveled all this way in order to track down their villain. We are in Tokyo, man! We gotta look around! See the town! After this, they try to have a normal vacation and do normal touristy things. <sighs> Robin and Starfire end up almost assessing their own relationship until Robin starts acting like a stupid boy superhero instead of a normal teenage boy. He becomes hyper fixated on Bashogun and wonders if a new villain is using his name as an alias. This dude's becoming more like Batman every day. Starfire tries to talk to him about if they could ever be more than friends and or co-workers, but Robin becomes frustrated in the fact that he wants to find this villain so badly. He tells Star that they need to stop acting like stupid kids, and instead they need to act like the heroes that they are. See what I mean? Star ends up flying away crying, because Robin's being a jerk boy instead of the cool, calm, and collected boy he needs to be for her. You, you go now! You eat too much, you! You will put me out of business! Later on, Robin ends up engaging in battle with the cotton candy villain yet again. But oddly, he's only pink this time. What are you? It ends in Robin winning, presumably literally murdering the ninja. Red stains appear all over Robin's hands, and the crowd around him assumes that he brutally murdered the cotton candy man. Daizo shows up and regrettably handcuffs Robin and takes him into custody for murder. Robin begs him to investigate the situation, as he would never break his code of honor as a hero. Daizo doesn't know what to say, as all the evidence points towards Robin. He puts him behind bars regardless of his begging. Meanwhile, Raven finds evidence through one of their readings that Prashogun did in fact exist and was never a myth. What's for dessert? 
Cut to Starfire. She confides in a little girl outside of a toy store about everything that has happened with Robin. During her explanation, she realizes that she and Robin do have chemistry, and that she isn't silly for having these thoughts, or for being upset with him about how he treated the situation. I feel this, and he does also, even if he fears to admit it. She thanks the girl and leaves the area to go and try and find Robin, only to find his mugshot broadcasted on their local news station. They're claiming that he brutally murdered the Cotton Candy villain, even though this just isn't the case. Obviously, his friends know this, and they're all on the same page regarding the possibility that he was set up. Whoa. He was telling us to stay out of trouble. Before the Titans are able to devise their plan, they are rudely interrupted by four separate monsters that have been sent by Bershogun. The battle seems bleak at first, but the Titans emerge victorious as per usual. Meanwhile, Robin escapes from police custody after a strange message from Bershogun blows up in his face. Bring him in, or bring him down. <laughs> He then goes undercover and learns more about this mysterious villain through conversations with sketchy bartenders on the bad side of town. Through them, he learns that Prashogun was indeed a real villain, but the Tokyo Troopers don't like mentioning him because it encourages more villains to emerge and or copycat behavior. Right after learning this, Daiso shows up to reprimand him. But Starfire shows up and rescues Robin just in time, flying him away from the scene. They meet up with the other Titans, and Raven recalls the information she read about Bershogun. What's up? Basically, he was an artist who fell in love with one of his own drawings. He became so infatuated with her that he used black magic to make her come to life. The black magic took him over, however, and he became Bershogun, Tokyo's first supervillain. Also, Tokyo's first crazy Tumblr user. <laughs> okay, I kid, I kid. Since then, he has been able to turn anything he imagines into a real breathing creature. The Titans also deduce that the person Robin killed wasn't a person at all, and that he was framed. The blood on his hands was actually just ink. I know where the trail leads. The Titans then eventually find Bershogun's hideout after many hours hunting the city for clues. Once in his lair, they find that Bershogun is actually an ink creature creating slave to a higher force. I sent the first to you as a messenger. He sent the second to Robin. Daiso! He reveals himself as the epic mastermind of it all. He did indeed capture Bershogun at first during his first ever villain spree, but since then he has encapsulated him and forced him to create more and more villains for him and his troop to reprimand throughout the city, granting him the leadership role of the famous and noble Tokyo Troopers. A battle ensues between them all, and Bashogun ends up begging the Titans to remove him from his ink machine and finally end all of the madness. They eventually do, and the nightmare concludes. And Robin finally kisses Starfire. Aw, oh, just look at that. It's about time. The movie concludes with the citizens of Tokyo thanking the Titans and presenting them with medals. One at a time, ladies. There's enough for me to go around. Beast Boy then suggests they vacation in Mexico next time, to which Raven smacks him unconscious. Yep, we're looking at Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans. After an admittedly amazing post credit scene in the movie Teen Titans Go to the movies that teased a return of the old team, we finally got what we all wanted. A one-off crossover movie and not a revival of the series. <sighs> Okay, anywho, this movie begins in the Teen Titans Go universe. TTG Raven's mind gem becomes cracked and her real demonic energy begins to emerge without her being in control of it. You totally wrecked that dude! TTG Trigon attempts to take away her powers in order for her to just live a normal girl life, but this just frustrates her as she knows it would just make him even more powerful. Meanwhile, in the living room, a portal shows up and demands that the TTG Titans fight or their Earth will be destroyed. They enter the portal and are pitted against the real Teen Titans. Big reveal. <laughs> It's only until Raven realizes that the TTG Raven is having her power sucked away from her that she becomes increasingly suspicious of the situation at hand. We can still win this! Have fun being a losers, losers! 
After questioning this, they find that their game master is actually TTG Trigon. TTG Trigon and the original Trigon then capture both of their ravens in order to suck out their energy and take over the multiverse. What's up with the one leg? <laughs> Tripod. <laughs> Leaving the pairs of titans to begin their rescue mission. Eventually, TTG Trigon gets fed up with Trigon and he absorbs him and all of his power. Well, I've had about enough of you. <laughs> Raven then calls all of the titans from different dimensions and morphs into a huge dragon after absorbing the other ravens. We are the unkindness. She defeats TTG Trigon and all is well. The different titans bid farewell and Raven helps TTG Raven embrace her demon side, making her a more well-rounded individual. And that is the entirety of Teen Titans. Amazing show. Cartoon Network, please revive the original series. We need more! We are, we are Teen Titans! We are, we are Teen Titans! Uh, anyway, I hope you all did enjoy the video. Consider dropping a like and subscribing, and let me know in the comments what you all want to see me cover next. Have a lovely day, everyone! See you soon!